Osier Ponds is located along the Coyote Creek Parkway in Coyote Valley. These old quarry pits were used to provide rock to build Highway 101. In 1995, Coyote Creek flooded and rerouted itself away from its main channel and into the ponds, creating new habitat. We're here today to explore nature around these ponds. BioBlitz events are a great way to get to see nature in an intimate way. Basically, you're looking at all living things, the biota, over a period of time, the blitz. Our naturalists will look for birds, bugs, plants, and aquatic creatures. This tour around Osier Ponds is a virtual deep dive nature walk. We'll be showcasing each presenter to learn what they find. Hi, my name is Deb Kramer. I'm the executive director of Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful, and I'm really glad that you're joining us today for this virtual bio blitz at Osier Ponds. I've been working on Coyote Creek for over six years and have really enjoyed developing community relationships around our creek. Our mission is to have a vibrant Coyote Creek with clean waters, abundant wildlife, natural beauty for everyone to enjoy. Our activities include creek and trail cleanups. We've also hosted BioBlitz events. We have bike rides and other recreational activities advocacy for the creek, offering it to our voice, and education to K-12 as well as the general public. I'll turn it over now to my colleague Junko from Grassroots Ecology. Hi, I'm Junko Bryant with Grassroots Ecology. Uh, we are a, another nonprofit organization. We do habitat restoration work at various local open spaces and parks, uh, ranging from Redwood City down to Los Gatos. We also do some other activities such as water quality monitoring on Stevens and San Francisco Creeks. And we've installed and maintained some rain barrels and rain gardens um, at various of our sites. And we're really happy to be here today uh, helping out with the BioBlitz and partnering with Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful. So uh, thanks for joining us and we're looking forward to see what we find out there. So we've talked about our organizations, Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful and Grassroots Ecology. I'd like to set the stage of where we are. So here is a sample of the Coyote Creek watershed and the creek itself, which starts at Henry Coast State Park. It flows through Anderson Lake, through Coyote Valley, into downtown San Jose, and out through Milpitas to the San Francisco Bay. Where the yellow circle is, is our Osier Ponds and Coyote Valley. Just to zoom in a little bit more, we've got Osier Ponds, which is smack dab between Coyote Creek Golf Course and Anderson Lake, adjacent to Highway 101. So as you can see, it was a convenient place to get some rock to build that highway. So let me introduce our speakers today. So first we have Marav Von Schack, who's a community science organizer she leads public events and programs in the South Bay, especially by organizing BioBlitz events and leading hikes and iNaturalist workshops. She's a leading community science programmer, such as in Pacific Newt's Roadkill Surveys and the Jasper Ridge Ant Survey. She also teaches natural history at San Jose State University and contributes to various science projects. Marav founded the BioBlitz.club, a home for community science events in the South Bay where people can learn about future activities and download free material, such as bird and flower guides. She has a BA in biology, MS in science and ecology, and a PhD in zoology. Our next presenter is Claire Elliott, who is a senior ecologist at the nonprofit Grassroots Ecology, where she teaches about and restores nature. Claire teaches an annual naturalist class and water pollution prevention classes in schools. In addition to restoring ecosystems and open uh, preserves, she designs, installs, and maintains green water infrastructure projects, such as rain gardens at rain barrel systems. Prior to joining the team in 2006, Claire worked for Stevens and Permanente Creek Watershed Council, Hidden Villa, consulting companies, the city of Palo Alto, and the US EPA. She holds a BS in biology from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, one year of freshwater ecology studies at the University of Uppsala, Sweden. How nice would that be? 
and an MS in Environmental Engineering and Science from Stanford. One of the things that I'd like to share with you today is that today is the start of the City Nature Challenge. This year's challenge, like last year's because of the pandemic, is a self-guided one in the sense that we encourage people to go out and explore nature on their own. Using the tool iNaturalist, we encourage you to add the observations that you have into the pr program, well, they'll automatically be entered into the City Nature Challenge for the San Francisco Bay Area. This is a four-day event, April 30th through May 1st, so Friday through Monday, and we hope that you'll participate. Our naturalist will also show you how to use the tool, and during the event, I'll be able to pull up some of their observations. So now I'd like to turn it over to Marat. Okay, so um, yes. Rob, can Hi. you share with Sorry. us what you've got? Yeah, I was just getting too excited about something we just found in, in the pond here. So this little guy is a leech. I wasn't sure what it was when it was just, you know, stuck on the rock inside the pond here. We'll show you where we are in a minute. But Colton and I are here by the pond and it's just, amazing this little thing so it's a leech that was under a rock and from what i understand these guys are actually looking for snails that's their food um, they're not really looking for us but it's always pretty interesting finding a leech and we don't find them too often it's only the second one i've seen in the bay area so this is pretty cool um and we have plenty other things to show you um swimming here in our little containers so we basically pulled up some rocks let me show you um yeah so we have a few containers and a net and we just pulled some stuff out of this really nice pond here there are all sorts of uh non-native vegetation mostly and some native vegetation that claire will talk about later but many interesting uh macro invertebrates little invertebrates that live here um in the pond and let me show you a few of them. So the, the largest one I've got is this Asian clam right here. So this is obviously a dead one. When they're alive, they'll have two valves like that um, closing on the little creature inside. And uh, all over the place, it's a non-native species that took over very successfully in the entire area. And this is just a piece of... Um, a crayfish, the red swamp crayfish, another non-native species, many non-native species here. So this is a piece of a pretty big lobster-like creature, like probably at least this big. Maybe we'll still see one today. And then there are all sorts of really cool insects. So let me scoop them out of here to show you. So this one right here, this is a damselfly. Demselfly larva. So the adult, let me get another one. There's a prettier one. The adult is a flying predator insect. Uh, the larva is also a predator, it's just aquatic. So many insects uh, finish their development in the water as aquatic larva, and then the adults would fly out. Um, and we'll show you how they do it later. Just because I want to get closer, so I have a macro lens on my phone. You can get closer and view the damsel fly nicely. So the head is up on top with two short antenna and large eyes so they can see their prey. And then in the back, you could see these tails. I think this one has only two. They should have three tails. Sometimes they have none. These are the gills. That's how they breathe oxygen from the water. And that's why we can use these creatures to learn about the quality of the water here. Because if the water is not good, if there's not enough oxygen in for them, they won't be here. We usually don't see damselflies and dragonflies. They're closely related to those guys as well. Um, so we usually don't see them when we look at the creek, chaotic creek or where the loop or other creeks uh, closer to downtown San Jose, where the water is not as clean as they are here. Uh, so we won't see these guys. But here the water is, is pretty good. We'll, we'll talk about that later a bit more. Claire would mention that. 
but we can also see other creatures that could be used as bioindicators. We could use them to learn about the quality of the water here, like this caddis fly lava. So this guy could kind of tolerate uh, low levels of pollution, unlike other caddis flies that are even more sensitive. And we found some adult caddis flies that we will share later. Um, so having a large biomass of caddis flies and also mayfly, so this is a mayfly larva, it's a different kind of aquatic uh, insect. Okay, so you can see the uh, mayfly has gills at the side of its abdomen, let me put it here to be more stable. Okay, now we could get closer. So you see these little leaves like uh, uh, structures on the side of the abdomen, these are the gills of the mayfly. So it also needs to get uh, dissolved oxygen from the water. And uh, mayfly larva are very sensitive to pollution as well. So we won't find them unless the water is really clean. Uh, so usually we won't find these guys in downtown uh, San Jose unless the water has been cleaned, which is nice. Okay. Let's see who else we've got here. Uh, I've got the flatworms. You can see if you could see one right there at the side of the container, of my mochi container. Very important that it's mochi. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Can you see that? That's a flatworm. These guys are really cool, but they can actually tolerate any level of pollution, you'd find them even in highly polluted areas, same as the snails. So we have a few different species of snails here. Unfortunately, these little ones here at the bottom of this container, these are the New Zealand mud snails. So you could guess that they're not native. Uh, this is actually a highly invasive species that is now spreading uh, around the South Bay. We started seeing them uh, more and more in, in our creeks and ponds. And that's really bad because they take over uh, entire habitat. They would, there could be tons of them in, in the habitat. And this one is a different kind of snail. The one here, yeah. Okay, so we have a few different species of snails. Snails are less uh, sensitive to pollution. So you could find them even uh, where the water is not, not very clean. And I wanna show you the overview of these creatures. And there are all sorts of little guys swimming around, but maybe we could tell, let uh, Claire share some things as well. And then we could go back and look at this, some of these tiny, tiny, tiny creatures. Okay. Coulter, can you give us a wide angle view of where you and Marab are just to kind of set the scene there? Absolutely. So there's Marav, and we've got a nice little pond that she's been pulling some of the critters out of. Okay, Sienna, let's send it over to you. Hi, this is Claire over here on the other side of the pond. I'm, I'm uh, down here exploring, looking for uh, I was hoping to find the exuvia of a dragonfly. I did find a damselfly um, and hopefully I'll be able to show it to you with my hand lens. Um, but I wanted to first give you a little bit of an idea of where we are in this pond. It's about 50 feet from where Coyote Creek enters this pond. So when Coyote Creek changed its course and filled up these old gravel quarries, it created these nice freshwater ecosystems, which is great for some species, but not so great for the migrating uh, anadromous fish like steelhead and salmon because they, they enter the, the pond. And one problem with ponds in general is that they don't have a directional flow. So fish sometimes can't find their way, but Jerry Smith, the fish expert at San Jose State says, that's a lesser problem here than the fact that the warm water is great habitat for things like largemouth bass that just gobble up all the the young steelhead and salmon, and uh, they can't make it back. They can't make it through to get back out. Um, sorry, I'm having head phone problems. I keep wanting to fall into the water. <laughs> my scarf over. It. So, so the well, we're going to head over there in a little bit, so you can see where the creek 
enters um, the pond. But anything trying to get up into the creek is challenged by this being a, a, a pond full of predators. Um, but there are a number of insects in here. I found the, the exuvia of a damselfly, although I may have just uh, lost track of it when I was looking further for the dragonfly larva. They're really my favorite of the aquatic insects because they, uh, they breathe and transport themselves at the same time. They scoot around with uh, jet propulsion from the water they bring up their butts. So they suck water in because that's where their gills are is on the tail end uh, inside of them. So they suck water in and when they breathe out, basically squirting that water back out, it transports them forward. And they're really fun to watch in a bucket because they scoot around really quickly. So I'm gonna step up out of the water here so we can talk a little bit about the vegetation. And uh, I'll turn my video back on so I can share some of the plants more close up. So there's a lot of cattails and there is tule, which as we posted on iNaturalist, there's a different common names for. Um, there's a number of different aquatic plants like the, or, or, or uh, water loving plants like the juncus and Sienna just discovered iris leafed rush, which is this one here. It's a, it's, re, it's related to the rushes, but it looks like an iris. So you might think it's an iris until you go to, to expect it to bloom and then it makes these tiny little rush like flowers. But one trick, which is really cool, like if you're at a nursery and you wanna buy a plant, you wanna make sure it's a, a Douglas iris and not an iris leaf rush, is you run your fingers up the leaves. And if there are little bumps on them, which I can feel, that's an iris leaf rush, not the iris. Sadly, there's also Fuller's teasel, which is a non-native species that loves wetland areas. Um, but there's also mule fat, which I know from growing up in Southern California along Creek, we don't have it so much farther up the peninsula. This is not a very pretty specimen of it. Maybe we can show you a nicer one later on. Um, it's a composite. It's got little flowers, kind of like uh, Marsh Bacchus does. Um, what else? Oh, and the sandbar willow. We'll see a lot of it over on the sandbar appropriately. It's also called narrow leaf willow or salix exigua, right? Yeah, salix exigua. We're still working on our willows here. A lot of them I thought were red willows because they have the furrowed trunk. Maybe you see there if I can zoom in. Oops. Ah, good. You're seeing now the, the picture of the salix exigua. Uh, and then the one in front of me is the, is the, I thought it was the red willow. Apparently they are extremely similar to the shining leaf willow, except that the shining leaf willow has glands on its stipules and petioles. So we're, uh, we're still, did you end up finding, I'm gonna have you look at Sienna. Sienna I, see, I didn't see glands. You didn't see glands. I need to look at the hand, a hand, hand lens. lens. Okay, well maybe when we have a break and Rob is talking, we'll look with, at a, them with a hand lens. Oh, there's a gall on this leaf. Let me see if I can reach it, I'm rather short. You want to pin my video again, Deborah Junko? Can you guys see the red balls? I don't know if it's in focus because my glasses are all steamed up. Could you show a close up? So, willows in general have different species of galls. Uh, usually, red ones in the middle of the leaf would be a soap fly larva. So, soap flies are primitive wasps and it's kind of difficult to see but it's I think to the that's petals. what it is. Bright, two bright shiny red. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. Yeah, it's it like the, uh, willow galls uh, made by so flies. Yeah, nice. Cool. Very nice. All right, yeah. well, let's cross it back over across the pond. You're over there somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Okay, thanks, folks. See you later. Okay, awesome. So we wanted to show you a couple of things. So how about we walk to this side of the pond? 
So yeah, Clary is somewhere there. You can see the highway from here. And earlier, yeah, actually now there are even more birds than we've seen before. So maybe Walter will talk about the birds in a few minutes. But before that, this is where we got some of these creatures that I've, sh I've shown you uh, under the rocks here. Someone built a little dam. So we removed a few of the rocks and put them back. But there's a big uh, bush of uh, docks, uh, Romex here. And it seems like the caddis fly adults. So remember we were talking about them as lava developing in water, but it seems like some of the adults are actually here on the plant. If you see that black uh, spot in the middle, let's try and get closer with the macro lens. So this is a caddis fly adult. Caddis flies are related to butterflies and moths. Um, and they have, Pretty similar wings, but the lava, the caterpillars develop in water. Yeah, so this is one species. They're not very easy to identify, but I think this might be identifiable. And the great thing about iNaturalist is that I can't identify caddis fly to species, but someone else might be able to. So I'll upload photos later and hopefully someone will identify them. There's a very different one right here. Let me show you, you see, like in the middle of the photo again, and I'll try and get closer so we could focus on it, but it's completely brown and doesn't look anything like the other one. So caddis fly, it's a big, oh, of course it took off. It's a big group of uh, insects. There are many, many different species in uh, different families that don't really look alike. Just the lava is very different between these families. And yeah, hopefully you can see this guy. As, you, as you've seen, once you disturb them, they take off, but sometimes you could get pretty close. The first one we've seen pretty well. Let me see if I could find another one because there are a few of them. There's another one. While making sure that I'm not going too deep into the water. Oop, yeah, took off again. Okay, so we saw a damselfly for a little bit. And yeah, I could, oh, and there's a really cool spider here. So spiders uh, often would build a, a web. This is a, build, a web building spider um, called long-jawed spiders. It belongs to that family. See it on my hand? So they build a nice uh, orb web right on top of streams and ponds often because there's so many different insects that would either come here to uh, get water from the pond or develop in the pond and then try living and they would eat them. So just like all spiders, they're uh, poisonous, but like almost all spiders, especially in California, they're not dangerous. So you could handle them easily. But anyway, that's a long jaw spider, very common, right above ponds and creeks. Um, okay, and then I wanted to show you a few of the little guys we had in our tray. So let's walk back. Okay. So yeah, let's have a little picnic with all these guys. And okay, yeah. Uh. So, um, I've been hearing a lot of birds around here recently, um, and my best guess is that it's some sort of wren. Um, if I had to guess, maybe a bird wren because they are around all the nice green plants. Um, I've also seen at least one common yellow throat. It's a beautiful. I think you need to mute over there and maybe get closer to me so they could hear you better so um if if it was too garbled that first time i saw a uh, common yellow throat very beautiful bird it's very small it has a black um, neck and also uh, a, a yellow neck and a black sort of mask not just eyes um and i also saw a green heron flying overhead that was very cool uh, my favorite thing about herons is that they have these very long necks that can extend, but uh, especially in the green herons, they like to be scrunched up so they look like a lot smaller than they are, and then all of a sudden they'll extend their very long necks to like, fish or something like that. 
Uh, yeah, those are some of the birds I've seen so far. How about the birds on the lake? What have we seen there? Oh yeah, uh, so earlier when we got here. Oh, and just a second, this is the green heron. Very beautiful bird. Because right. uh, Junko is uh, sharing a photo of yes. the green heron, which is awesome. They're absolutely one of my favorite birds because they're just so awkward. Um, <laughs> and they only get more awkward when you hear what they sound like. It's, very, it's like a, a frog, almost frog-like. Uh, we also saw a pied bill grebe. So it, it's, uh, it's a animal that almost looks like a duck, but it's a little bit smaller and its bill is less flat, it's more triangular from the profile view. And it's light in color and it has uh, black patterns on it. Also, Mirav spotted a common gallon mule earlier today, which is a fun bird. It, it looks like uh, an American coot, but it has a very colorful bill and colorful legs. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so lots of birds, and we keep hearing all sorts of bird songs, and I'm lucky to have Colter here because he could, could identify at least some of them. Um, okay, and then I wanted to show you some of these little guys here in my tray. So these are little, very small things that I got with, with my net, and otherwise I wouldn't be able to see them probably. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share them with this other lens. Hello. Uh, on my front camera. So a second, I need to adjust that. Okay, so let's try, let's see if it works. Because if, if it does, then it's really fun to be able to see all the tiny, tiny guys. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm trying to scoop out and you can actually uh, use Polter's view for a second because then you'll be able to see what I'm doing. Um, yeah, thank you. Until I adjust my camera well enough, but I'm using this little lens here uh, on top of my front view camera. It's always a bit tricky to put it exactly where it needs to be, but I think now it's working. So let's try that again. If you could change to my camera. Yeah, so now it's where it's supposed to be. And let me get another Twitter here. So in these ponds, we have all the different insects that we talked about, but we also have different kinds of crustaceans. Many of them are very, very, very tiny. Like this guy, can you see it swim? Mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't it cute? So I actually created a little guide for you that you could download from my website, Fablets Club. Um, and you could identify these guys using the guide. Because there are a few different groups of very small crustaceans. Earlier when I showed you one of the other guys, there were some cool crustaceans there as well. Let's see if I can get another one. Because I see lots of them swimming here. Yeah, and you can even uh, show the, the flyer if you'd like and share it with them. Um, yeah, but anyway, you can see some of them swimming here. Yeah, these are the guys. Okay, so this is one side. The other one has this crustacean in it. Yeah, and you can see that they, are, they come in all sorts of sizes. Yeah, so these are the, the crustaceans and we have, we have these guys over there in the guide. Um, there was another one that I didn't show you earlier. Let me switch to the other camera. Okay, um, yeah, so let me show you these guys because these are pretty cool. And the interesting thing about these macroinvertebrates is that in some places you just have none of them and then in other places, you could have hundreds or even thousands of the same kind. This is a water boatman. It's a true bug. True bug is actually a common name for a group of insects. So this one is called water boatman. Where is it? Sorry. Oh, here it is. So you see it has, it uses its uh, legs like flippers 
they can swim very well and they actually don't need to uh, breathe uh, dissolved oxygen. They take a bubble of air, uh, atmospheric air uh, under their abdomen and they use that to breathe oxygen. And when they ran out of oxygen in that bubble, then they have to get up to the surface and get the new bubble of air. We got a question from the Yes. Audience. What do the Chinese crustaceans like to eat? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I guess depending on what they are, I would guess some, so some of the creatures here, they feed on um, decaying material in the pond, like different things that fall into the pond. There's all sorts of, uh, I mean, let's look at the pond, it's right here. So there's all sorts of like organic matter here, different algae and uh, both algae that grows in the water, but also leaves and other uh, plant material that would fall into the pond and into creeks. So they might be feeding on that. And then we have the predators like the damselfly larva, um, and uh, yeah, other uh, predators, and we'll maybe go back to that later. Okay. So yeah, let's move to Claire. All right. Yeah, my awesome damselflies and dragonflies. <laughs> As uh, one of my old zoology textbooks says, the big fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them, and little fleas have littler fleas, and so on infinitum. So <laughs> that's just because the crustaceans eat littler crustaceans and so on. Anyway, we're here. I just wanted to show you before we went down to the creek where we came from and what your choices are with this really cool bike path that I had never been on and I'm going to come back to uh, along the Coyote Creek. So you go that direction, which is um, south to get to the Coyote Creek Visitor Center. And then you can go to the north a couple miles from here to get to the golf course. So we parked our cars over by the golf course and rode our bikes over here. Um, you can see the, the landfill. I think that's correct, Deb. Is that right? The landfill across the highway there. Um, and you can see the pond down here. Um, the, the pond, we just drew the trees there. You might see the pond and you see Sienna waiting for me because I said I wanted to talk about the plants here. <laughs> so we're going to talk about plants that are in the upland area like this coyote brush. Probably a lot of you know this plant. But uh, I checked out of the Stanford Library a PhD thesis from, I think it was just a map. Oh, it must have been a PhD. It was a volume of work on, on the ecosystem of a coyote brush written in 1948 by a guy named Tilden. I think it was 240 some invertebrates. It's, it's just a variable ecosystem all in itself. And they call it a nursery plant. And here it's doing that. It's being a nursery for natives, not always. Sometimes it's a nursery for non-natives, but um, it, it just means it's got cool, providing some cool shade and a little more moisture for some native plants. And in this case, all along under this coyote brush is my favorite native plant as far as giving us a, a, a scent to enjoy. So I have it growing in my yard all the time, even though it's biennial. I just let it seed wherever I want, even if it's like right next to my bike, I just go around it <laughs> because it smells like maple syrup and curry, two of my favorite things. I guess it's the fenugreek in the curry that has that scent. So you can see the picture that Deb's just brought up of the Pseudonephalium californica. They changed the name. It used to be uh, just plain Nephalium, but now we just have to have the pseudo variety. Um, we've got a number of other non-native and native plants. So we've got mustard. And but the main thing I wanted to show you down here, and I'm sorry if it's jerky, but I want to show you the Arroyo lupin because they're beautiful. Oh, they're going to be in the shade unless I go down to this one. They are making a bouquet here with one of my least favorite weeds, which is hawk's beard. And it seems like it's really making a comeback, or I mean, a, it's spreading like crazy. Fortunately, it is a an annual, unlike its relative, the cat's ear. But these um, lupins are just gorgeous. Lupinus succulentus, and you can see why it's called that because it's very succulent. Um, there were some wonderful pods on some of them. Is that the one behind me, Jenna? I think farther down here, there's one with some gorgeous big teeth 
pod because it's in the pea family. But I also wanted to share that um, not all bunch grasses are native. This is one that really needs to be controlled. It's Milo grass. Oh, there you've got a picture of Sienna's, Sienna's nice picture from my net of the, of the royal lupin. But here we have um, this grass I should have given Deb a picture of because it's really important for everybody to know because not all bunch grasses, some people hope that all bunch grasses are native. They've lost their seeds for the year, um, but you can see that it will have an array of tiny little kind of roundish seeds on these, I guess they're panicles. And then it's got very jointed stems, a little bit of red at the nodes. And it's just a big bunch. And fortunately, it doesn't have terribly deep roots, so it's pretty easy to dig them up, but they are spreading throughout here. We're going to pass it back over to Marav soon, but oh, there's a beautiful patch of, um, can I zoom in? Maybe I can't on Zoom. I can't zoom on Zoom, but there's some um, California poppies over there that are just beautiful, a nice little remnant patch, I assume, underneath the eucalyptus, but also the willows and a cottonwood, which is lovely to see. There's also a number of sycamores around here, and I'm hoping they're all the native sycamores and haven't hybridized with our London plane trees. They're not looking that great, some of them, because I think they've been separated from the, the floodplain. Um, you know, there, there's not enough water getting to them. You can see just over the top of Sienna, or just to her side, there's some dead branches. That's of a sycamore tree. All right. Thank you. We're going to head down to the creek now. Rob, are you able to take it back? You could walk with us down to the creek otherwise. Oh, there she is. Yeah, at the moment, Marav is looking at some uh, fish she just caught. Um, she's trying to focus her lens on it. Um, once well, we I think that, this, this might be a good her. time for a little game that we have. So let me go ahead and get that started. Okay, so what do you see? You want to put in chat what you see. Jinko can call them out. We have Toad. All I see are sticks, you guys. Deb, do you want to give us a hint and point in the general area of the critter we're trying to find? Unfortunately, my cursor doesn't work on this, but <laughs> you can see Coulter trying to get a decent picture of it. And it ends up being an American bullfrog that was quite nicely camouflaged. Oh, good spotting to Jay. You're in the right area. So yes, you can see it's towards the middle of the image. Okay, Marab, are you ready? Of course I'm ready, yes. You're ready, you were born ready, girlfriend? <laughs> yes, yes, I was. Yeah, okay. So yeah, you could choose either way. You could see me or you could see the fish. So we've got all the fish. It's probably a mosquito fish. There are a few different species of fish here. Unfortunately, of course, some of them are non-native. It's difficult to tell if it's focused or not. Maybe it's I'll just share. Quite. Quite. It's not quite, right? So let me just no. share. This is the fish. There are plenty of them swimming here. Uh, it's probably the non-native mosquito fish. Let me just release the rest of them. And then I can share a photo I just took. So just a second. OK, so. Let me share a photo, like this one. Yeah, so this is uh, probably one of these mosquito fish. I'm not 100% sure because I'm not very good with fish, but again, I'll upload it to iNaturalist and someone will be able to tell me. Uh, okay, and now I wanted to show you a couple of things, just a second. Okay. So we want to also take you for a little walk here into the pond. I hope 
Calder, oh, Calder doesn't have boots. So, well, I don't know if Calder is going to follow or not. But one thing I wanted to show you was this exuvia, which is a skin of uh, damselflies. So we saw the damselfly larva. Oh, and here's an adult, look at that, it's right next to me. But yeah, it didn't stay there. Um, okay, so this is the damselfly. Wow, it's so difficult to see. Yeah. So this is uh, the damselfly skin. We saw the little larva, the little predatory larva that lives in the pond. When they're ready to transform into an adult, they don't actually have a pupa stage like um, butterflies do. They have incomplete metamorphosis, so they just crawl onto the vegetation. And the new damselfly will uh, fall out of its skin and molt. Okay, so we see that often on different plants. And you know, when we try to record nature observations, then if we see the damselfly, that's great. If we see the lava, that's great. But sometimes we just see things like that and we could record that as well. We could take a photo of the exuvia and say, well, damselflies live here. Okay, and yeah, I'm trying not to fall into the pond because that would be kind of fun too. It's getting a bit warm here in the morning it was pretty cold and we wanted to show you something so here's two different species of willow probably native ones and willows are great plants because they support lots of different insects uh, claire already showed us gall made by um sawfly which are uh primitive wasps and galls are structures induced by insects or sometimes other creatures that serve as home to different organisms. So basically the plant creates a little shelter for the insect. And here's a different kind that I want to show you on this willow. And unlike Claire, I'm not very good with identifying willows, but look at that. So this is um, like a normal growth on willow. Okay, just leaves. And at some point they have their flowers. Oh, and there's actually another one of these um, uh, caddis fly adults. Let me show you that. Oh, of course, it's no longer here. Never mind the caddis fly. But anyway, so this is what it normally looks like. And then this is what it looks like. Yeah, and this is Coulter hiding. <laughs> this is what it looks like when it's full of galls. And oh, and another one of these spiders we've seen before. Okay, hiding. So this is a gull made, I'm not sure by what, because I've never seen one like this before. Uh, there's a new book that just came out last week and maybe it's in there, but it could be a new species because gulls are really understudied and we don't know much about them. I would guess that this one is made by a mite. Mites are tiny arachnids related to ticks and some of them create gulls. That uh, usually looks like this part and yeah, usually they don't look like this. But anyway, uh, these creatures develop inside and the plant create this structure for them. Not because they want to, just because the, um, the organism hacked into their systems and made them do it. Yeah, and there are lots of different species of galls. The Bay Area is very diverse, especially in oaks. And you could uh, download the guides that I made and go out and look for them because this is the best time to look for spring galls. Uh, in the middle of the summer and the fall, there's some even nicer ones to see. So yeah, hopefully you'll go out and try and look for them. And for the city nature challenge, this is something really cool to observe because they're very uh, understudied and we would like to document them all. So it's, it's nice to tell people about them. I want to show you a spider crawling on this willow. So it's kind of in the middle of my frame it stopped moving yeah now it's moving a little bit this is a jumping spider so jumping spiders are a large family of spiders you can see it going down it's a pretty small one there's some much larger ones in the bay area still there this is probably the zebra jumping spider this is a genus with a few different species i think um but yeah you can see it right there so you see, once you start looking, you'll find lots of other things. Um, Claire, would you like to uh, show us something or otherwise I could do something else here with a willow. 
I'm actually going to do a little poll real quick before we switch over to Claire. Okay. Can so, I see? I it's straight. So where Claire and Sienna are, it's pretty open and you're able to see a lot of the valley. So here's a poll, which large bird recently turned, returned to the valley, valley after nearly a hundred year hiatus? You've got three choices, a condor, a Swainson's hawk, or a flamingo. So the answer is actually the Swainson talk. And that bird had returned uh, about a hundred after 102 years of not being seen in this area, but it had been seen in other locations throughout the California area. So I think we're going to switch now back to Claire and Sienna. All right, <laughs> we are now down at the creek. You can see I've shed a few layers because it's getting warm out here. Um, <laughs> I look pretty silly, don't I? Well, I've got I've got two pairs of glasses on. I have not paved and gotten bifocals yet, so I'm wearing the ones that help me see the tree, the birds and the trees, and the ones that help me see my phone and the and the bugs. But we are down here on the creek. I've got to turn my phone back around. Um, and I guess you can see from Sienna's view too um, that the creek is flowing from the south, north into the pond. And we'll work our way down so you can see the mouth of the, the well, where the creek enters the, the pond. But I took a sample with my D net, which is this contraption uh, that allows you, you stick it down into the rock. And then you stir up the gravels and the cobbles and see who is lively and can swim out of that. And so I will wash this carefully and bleach it when I get home because we don't want to move New Zealand mud snails around. That's a very important thing to clean your boots, clean all of your equipment you've had in the water. Um, but let me show you what I have. And uh, let's see. Uh, I dropped my backpack and it had my macro lens in it, but you've seen a lot of these close up with Mirage. Um, is it going to let me zoom? Oh, that's right. Zoom doesn't let me zoom. Um, yes, please. And my blue jacket in case it can pop <laughs> it. Anyway, uh, what we have here in this in this ice cube uh, compartment is a very large version. I don't know if can you put up the picture, uh, Deb, did I put the picture of the isopod? An isopod is a crustacean like a pill bug. And this is an aquatic pill bug, uh, which are mostly marine. There are very few uh, freshwater pill bugs. And here's the cute guy I found. He was only about maybe a centimeter long. Um, and there were several of them that size and smaller. This guy. No, 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 I'm sorry, maybe about, oh, a third of a centimeter. This guy is probably a couple centimeters long, um, and, but the same, I'm pretty sure the same species. And uh, yeah, as Juco said just in the chat, she loves the beady eyes. I think they look like something that somebody like a Studio Ghibli ought to make an anime out of a story of the, of the aquatic isopod. Um, but we have a couple of different kinds I was hoping to remember the name of this caddisfly that's kind of green. Um, I had them in the ice cube tray, unfortunately, in the same section with the other caddisfly over here on that side, and they were they were trying to eat each other, so I had to separate them. Uh, it looks like he's not trying to eat the mayfly he's in there with. Um, but you can see the bucket of, that I emptied the net in is just lively with the little mayflies. Um, and another one of the bigger um, isopods. Now, the picture that you could see on iNaturalist of, um, of the ostracod, the seed shrimp, 
and uh, the tiny little mite I collected with my plankton net. Uh, Karan, who's on this uh, call, or was at the beginning, he helped us to develop a microbe and sewage curriculum for our school water pollution prevention program. And I got so excited about things that you need a microscope to see that I bought myself a microscope. And uh, I only use a dissecting scope to get that picture, but I'm gonna try, try using a microscope on a sample. I'm gonna collect a sample in this plankton net, both from the creek and from the pond and see what I can find that's different. For our California naturalist class last year, I hadn't bought a plankton yet, so I made, made them, two or three of them for the class to use out of my mother's old nylons and a uh, spice jar duct tape on, just a piece of wire from a clothes hanger, and I just fixed it on, and it actually worked pretty well. We, we used it down in the Palta Bay lands and found a number of really cool uh, plankton that were, were out there. So there's a lot of fun ways to find, simple and cheap ways to find little tiny guys as well. But let's, uh, let's scroll around and look, see here. Um, what the vegetation is like where we're sitting. Uh, you can see in the sunshine over there by the tree, there are um, watercress, which is kind of naturalized all over the world. It is edible. Um, it's in the mustard family, it has a nice mustardy, spicy flavor. There is, oh, you want to show the mugwort. Can you get the camera on the mugwort over there, Sienna, or is that? You see Sienna's camera is on mugwort, which is loves it along creeks. Um, it's it's a, a plant that if you collect it, it's supposed to give you lucid dreams uh, if you put it in your pillow at night. Um, and then over here on the other side of me is a is a non-native mint, I'm 90% sure, but you have to be very careful with non-native mints. I put my hand in to uh, look more closely and mixed in there is this plant right here. Let's see if I can get my hand behind it, but I don't want to touch it. And maybe a lot of you know why I don't want to touch it. That is stinging nettle. It's also in the mint family, but it's uh, treacherous to handle. So I just saw the chat that we're running low on time. We wanted to follow this creek out to the mouth. But uh, why don't we try, give us five, three minutes to get down there while we switch back to Marat. Would that work? Okay, yeah. So we are right here in the pond, the same pond. Uh, we are shaking some of these uh, willows to see what's, what we could find on them. So let me do it a little bit so we can see what we're doing. And shaking vegetation is just a good way to see what's on it because it's kind of difficult to look at the plant and actually see something. And though we did see some caddis flies and moth um, on the plant. But when we were shaking it, we found some spiders right here. So again, the same spider, maybe we can show you the web somewhere. So they make a large uh, oak web to catch all these flying guys, because we also found all sorts of nodin biting midges, like these little ones, and some bugs. So these are tree bugs or aphids, maybe aphids. Uh, but anyway, little bugs that feed on the plant sap. So they suck the fluid out of the plant. Um, what else did we have here? Let's see. So yeah, these are the two different species of willow. And they also have all sorts of galls like we've seen and a different kind, like this stem gall. Okay, you want to show them this one? Yeah, so you see, this is like the normal stem growth. And then this one is what it looks like when there's someone developing inside. And in this case, I can't remember, it's either a midge or a sawfly again, but there are a few different insect groups that use willow, which is great. Um, okay, so what else? Is Claire ready to finish what she wanted? 
I'm getting close. I'm wading through the uh, cattails and tule to show you where the creek, it starts to slow down a lot because it spreads way out. Ralph, maybe you can talk about the swallowtai butterflies as she's making her way. Yes, thank you, Deb, because we actually just saw one uh, flying and I was mentioning to Colto that we made a slide about it. So last time you were here, we saw this huge, beautiful swallowtail. We saw the Western tiger swallowtail last time. Now I can't even tell which one it was. It could have been the tiger swallowtail. It was just, you know, passing by quickly. Uh, we have four different species. It's mostly like three that are kind of common in the South Bay. Uh, the fourth one is not that common, but I was also expecting to find a neat swallowtail, which I think is the most common in the Bay Area, uh, at least in the South Bay, because they uh, feed, so one of their host plants, it's a non-native uh, plant, the fennel, that is very common here and all along the Bay. Uh, and we saw the host plant here, so we were thinking maybe we'd see eggs. This is the time when they, the females lay their eggs on the plant, so we might see caterpillars uh, feeding on fennel. They also use uh, native plants as well, and we were thinking we might see them, but not yet. Okay, so yeah, yeah, this is the life cycle of the anise swallowtail, which is really cool. So you can see the egg is like a little yellow blob on fennel. Um, the caterpillars are very pretty. When they just hatch, they actually mo look more like ants or I don't know, something else. They don't look as, as pretty as they are when they're uh, almost fully matured. And then uh, they make their pupa on the plant and then you get the adult. Great, thanks. Let's go back to Claire. It looks like she's gotten to where the Coyote Creek dumps into the uh, water into the lake there. I have. I'm getting a little stuck in the mud here, but I can see a coot out there. I'm at the at the opening of the creek, the where it enters the mouth, and I can work my way up a little bit so you can see it's very slow here. So it's gotten uh, shallow, but it starts to flow more swiftly as we get up. You can see the uh, the creek flowing in the entrance of the pond here through a thicket of willows. These are the sandbar willows, the really narrow leaf ones. And there's a sedge. Sienna, remind me which the smaller of the two. They're both really big sedges. There's, uh, it's a bull, it's called a bulrush, but we're pretty sure it's a sedge. Uh, and it's this, this one was a, sedges have edges, but they called it a, a bulrush. Um, and then, there's a smart weed, it's in the polygonaceae family. We haven't um, remembered exactly what the species is. Then we've got some little tiny floating plants here. Um, but in my haste to find them, all of a sudden the name went right out of my head. Somebody help me. The tiny, it's not the azola, the fern that's in the pond, it's the, uh, it's, it's, it's apparently got one of the smallest flowers of the flowering plant world. Um, well, we'll put it in uh, on iNaturalist. Duckweed. Okay. It's called duckweed. And here it is. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we have to end on we have to end on duckweed probably, huh? <laughs> yeah. The little floaters there. So we're a little over sorry. time. We're a little bit over time, but I will go ahead and close this out now. Thank you everyone for participating. And if you have any last minute questions, you certainly can put them in the chat. Uh, just reminder that this weekend is the City Nature Challenge, and really hope that you'll get out there to participate. It's a lot of fun. We get to see all the sorts of things that people identify and observe throughout the Bay Area. And if you'd like to join us, we are hosting an event at Hellier County Park, 
and it'll be a bio blitz just for two hours from 9 a.m. till 11 a.m. and grassroots ecology and keep caddy creek beautiful are working with bio blitz club to make this event happen and uh, finally if you'd like to learn a little bit a little bit more about our local watershed and conservation efforts and some of the urban wildlife uh, we have on may 5th wednesday a Kaidi creek watershed tour so again thanks to rob and claire for all of their great efforts to share with us what they're finding during the virtual bio blitz and just to let you know we have uh, myself and Junko from grassroots ecology who have been behind the scenes here driving zoom and Coulter and Sienna out in the field where they've been uh, helping to follow our uh, naturalists so again thanks everyone for joining us